Hi, this is Mike from Bad Religion. I'm Brian from Bad Religion. You are watching Heavy Consequence. Hey everyone, it's Spencer with Heavy Consequence. I'm here with Brian and Mike from Bad Religion. Hello. Hi. Hello, <laughs> Spencer. Hi. <laughs> hey. Uh, honor to have you guys here. Our and, pleasure. Uh, you know, here you are at Louder Than Life Festival. Uh, it for is For musicians who have been playing live your whole life, yeah. uh, you know, in some cases more than 40 years. Um, Oof. <laughs> That's kind of scary. <laughs> what was it like to have that shut down, and what's it like to be back? Um, well, the shutdown was was when all of us assessed who we are as people. Like, who am I? What, what is, you know, I've been kind of like faking my way through life playing music, but I didn't really have time to, you know, ponder life's real complexities. And then I did that for about three weeks and then just went back to just being me and trying to write music at home. I mean, it wasn't, it was really, the bad part is, is that we couldn't play for people who had bought tickets. Yeah. And that was the worst. It's like, I just, uh, I hated that. And we spent all of our time since the pandemic lockdowns going back and trying to catch up. Yeah. Um, because it's just not fair. Yeah. You know? What about for yourself? You know, I. It's interesting, like, I have a bunch of friends who are like professional cyclists in Europe, right? So we both had a very similar thing where we we would talk to each other, like WhatsApp, and I really. We, we would say, like, it's possible maybe this will never come back. Or, you know what I mean? It might be 10 years. Like, it'll. And I really had a, a deep think where I was like, maybe. If this thing doesn't get under control, live music just will have to be, you know, like, they don't have chariot races anymore. You know what I mean? Like, it just, it would be a thing of the past. And it, uh, and it was pretty frightening. You know, it, and I mean, I, I don't, I mean, people were dying, obviously, so it, there were bigger issues going on. But but I really thought, yeah, maybe just, this will go, this will go away. And that yeah. was, then it's like, now what? You know? Yeah. Yeah. I've spoken to a lot of musicians that... All they knew was album tour, album tour, yeah. yep. and they said for the first couple of months, you know, they actually got to enjoy their families, or they, they, uh, you know, got. To, but then they said after that, they said, they said went into a very bizarre uh, mental state a little bit. Yeah, well, I, I definitely checked out, and you know, it was like a combination. Of, uh, now I have the time to do all these things I've wanted to do my whole life, like learn to speak Italian, and I'm gonna, you know, I'm gonna build a new porch on the yeah. back of the old farmhouse. And, uh, you know, so there's a lot of that kind of busy work, and you learn why you didn't learn Italian because it's hard. And <laughs> why I don't build a porch in the back of a shed because the shed's falling down, and then you have to build the shed first. And so there was a lot of starting and stopping with these personal missions, just little errands. But I think the time to reflect was the most valuable for me. It's just you know the, to really have a chance to assess how amazing it is that that this exists at all. Yeah, you know, the gratitude that I have. All of these years of people wanting to hear music that I help make is just it's overwhelming and very joyous to me. And so I, I in that pause I really understood the gravity of what we do. Yeah. And it's uh, it's awesome. And you guys released The Age of Unreason in 2019. It was written and released during the Trump administration. And I find with punk music, hardcore music, I feel like the greatest uh, album songs come when there's a right-wing administration or a conservative administration in place, uh, whether it's the 80s during the Reagan years yep. and Trump. And is that fair to say that kind of the great punk music comes in reaction to who's kind of in power at the time? I mean, yeah, let's not forget Margaret Margaret Thatcher, the, yeah. the yeah. Iron, was she the Iron Lady? The Iron yeah. Lady, yeah. of course. And then I remember uh, Annabella from Bow Wow, an interview was like, Bloody Iron Lady, she's a bloody bitch. I just thought that was <laughs> yeah. I mean, funny. It's, look, con conflict is always bred good music, and I think uh, it, at least in a, the American a, a American system of government, it's like you know, punk punk is is a folk music, and so it's the type of thing that when there's somebody uh, or, or there's a party in power that stands for everything that you that you don't approve of, that you that that you feel is wrong. Um, what better vehicle to speak out? And in Bad Religion, of course, we've had a pretty good history of trying to point out uh, things that are, you know, dangerous to the human condition. And certainly, a, uh, you know, a psychopath with somewhat of significant power you know, in the Oval Office was a, was a, a good time to, to sing about. Yeah. yeah. And, uh, you know, 
you're still actually because of the pandemic you're still supporting that album you know three years later but are the kind of wheels in motion the creative juices flowing for yeah. the next one yeah they are um i just talked to brett the other day and he's starting to dust off his writing boots <laughs> Um, and you know the process is the same always. It's we, a new record comes once Brett and Greg have written enough songs that they want to share with each other and see like, okay, sir, you know, are we on the right path? And sometimes that takes. If there's two years between albums. Sometimes there's four. Um, but there's always an album. And, uh, I, I, it's exciting that it's going to start. So hopefully we'll get something done next year. Cool. And you also released um, Emancipation of the Mind on Biden's inauguration. And now, uh, a few years, well, what are we, uh, maybe a year and a half into yeah. that, what are your thoughts on uh, what the job he's been doing so far? I, I think that, uh, I, I think that Biden's agenda, to, to imagine the difficulty to have constant back push on every sing, single thing you do, and people who don't look at the results of what's, uh, of, of the efforts, but the Biden administration has done, in my opinion, and is, has done nothing but make good on their promises and support the people that elected them and that, the, you know, the, not the people that elected them, the, they're, they're concerned about uh, public service, not being served by the public. Uh, and so it's really a, just, it's a laundry list. Uh, yeah. I'm, I'm also happy to have, there's a stability there that I think underlying a lot of the Trump administration just not knowing what's going to happen next. I mean, you, you have this this wild, uh, this, this, I don't know, this sense of, of like anarchy mixed with, uh, with, uh, just the opposite of uh, public protection, you know, it's personal, personal gain over the public, and that's not the point of the democracy. Yeah. And if, if Trump does decide to run again for 2024, do you see, you know, uh, punk bands and hardcore bands kind of rising up and maybe uh, whatever rallies, singing at rallies, or, or trying to get the word out and trying to see, and, you know, speak out against them? No, I think at this point, that's just putting, giving oxygen. Um, I don't think that there's really any worry about uh, about the resurgence of, of Trump, but the resurgence of Trumpism is very real, and that's you know what 2022 is all about. So it's really, uh, I think it's it's about it's about our representatives, and that always that will. I'm sure anti-flag will say something uh, tonight, pro federal I wanted to ask, um, you just mentioned anti-flag, they were kind of the next generation uh, after my, after uh, Mad Religion, and uh, are there any young fans either of you can answer that are kind of exciting you now, that uh, kind of remind you of, of, of you know early 80s punk, hmm. hardcore? You know, sometimes at a festival I'll hear somebody, I mean, I, I will freely admit I've become like the middle-aged guy who would just keep buying like Eric Clapton reissues, <laughs> which I can't stand the man, but but yeah. I do it with the Sex Pistols and the Clash. Like, oh yeah. look, there's another box set of London Calling that has, you know, Joe talking about the cigarettes he likes. And I'm like, I buy it. Any magazine, I just like, oh shit, it's the same I, pictures I've seen. I, so, I, I kind of, I actually, I, I really enjoy trying to find new stuff, but yeah. I do it at my own tempo. So when I find something that's new, it turns out it's been happening for five yeah. years. But at least I found it. And uh, recently, uh, I love Amal of the Sniffers, oh, yeah. the Australian band. That's just so punk, and, and I just I just love it. Yeah. I, I love the whole thing. I like uh, I very much like Turnstile, who I've actually been following for maybe about five years. I think they're brilliant, and I have a DC. Yeah. Um, and I can hear so many great influences, and they do something totally different with it. Yeah, you know, and it's uh, it's really nice. To yeah, see I find that. them to be one of the most exciting bands around. Well, because they're, style. they're not a tribute act. They're yeah. just they're they they have this information and they synthesize it into something new. I love and uh, Sleaford Mods are probably my favorite <laughs> band now, and that reminds me of all of this early UK discharged, exploited <laughs> um, in the mouths of Jason Williams. The uh, incredibly powerful too, so I like that. And Brian, of course, you were a member of Minor Threat, and uh, one of my favorite all-time bands. You kind of set the internet on fire a few years ago when you posted that newer, 
edition of the famous pork shop in front of the Discord headquarters. Um, yeah. And my question is, like, when you look back, I'm sure you got about the legacy of that band and, and the influence of that band and what Ian went on to with Gazi and everything like that. I mean, what are your like fondest memories of, of being in Minor Thread and like, what do you hear from people kind of all the time uh, about, you know, even though it was a brief time, what the band meant to them? Well, my, my favorite part is how much the band meant to me because it was truly, you know, it, it was a, an after school band and no one had any long term vision about this band still having some significance to people so many years later and that I'm grateful incredibly grateful and I'm also proud of it because it was uh, you know it's just it's just a one in a million shot it, it would still resonate um, and just times in the band you know it was just so radically different and I was so young that I don't know if it was because of minor threat but these these uh, what I think about is I think of, well, I guess it is I wouldn't be there but meeting these people in other towns and other scenes because that's how we ran i mean you didn't have promoters and you didn't obviously you didn't have cell phones or any of that and you would basically write letters back and forth to people who like oh my god there's a punk scene in detroit and that's how we met negative approach and these are this whole new scene happening where we'd never seen before or there's people in boston like the ssd control guys so all these relationships i made when i was 16 years old i still have now and that is invaluable, and that is really, I think, the, the thing that Minor Threat did the most for my life, was to, to give me all these great minds and great people at such a young age, so I spent my whole life with, uh, with great friends.